right, so we're here with electric vehicles in industry. And uh, I'm Jim Frazier, Vice President of Smart Cities here at, at ARC Advisory Group. And I really am very sincerely um, uh, pleased that I'm joined by uh, three of my colleagues in the industry. All of them I really consider friends. I've known them, some of them for quite, quite a while. This really, I've been looking, for this, looking forward to this session all, all week. <clears throat> so, silence your devices. We are recording this and you know, it will be in HD on, on YouTube and a variety of other formats. So uh, let's not hear any of that extraneous noise. Uh, if, <clears throat> you, know, you know the app, give us five stars on the app, please. <clears throat> I would just like to speak a few minutes and, and put electric vehicles um, into a framework about sustainability. This very, this crude, very intentionally crude diagram covers the three pillars of sustainability as are generally accepted by the world today. It's not just preserving the environment. It's also so, a social, societal issues of a safe route to school for your kids, of a robust, of uh, uh, good jobs, good education system. And the one that's very often forgotten the most is the economic portion of it. If we don't have a strong financial business model, those others are not going to happen and it becomes just an academic exercise. So you probably recognize this diagram that the convergence of all three of those really is your sustainability sweet spot. Now th this chart, this Venn diagram, ha has been criticized that it really doesn't put things into true perspective. And the, the philosophy that's taking hold increasingly is the one on the right side of the screen. That humans, when we think about sustainability, think about that environment first, then those social aspects, and then the economy. So th that one on the right really is resonating quite a bit more with the community in the last, oh, I don't know, two, three, three years. <clears throat> How many of you have seen this chart? Okay, that's about half of us. <clears throat> when we talk about electric vehicles, it's not, it, it's not just a standalone thing. It impacts the, uh, well, I should, I got ahead of myself. These are the 17 uh, World Economic F Forum Sustainable Development Goals. And good health and well-being, electric vehicles, clean, clean water and sanitation, clean energy, innovation. It hits quite a few of these. Climate action. Um, <clears throat> so that's, it's important to just know that electric vehicles touch many, many aspects of, of our sustainability efforts. Now this is a more general slide from, from some ARC research, but it's interesting to see that over just about 25% of companies today do have formal sustainability programs and a third, an additional third, actually have targets and goals. <clears throat> There's many challenges in the world of sustainability. I like highlighting the first three here, which are finding the right technologies is, is a large challenge. Tracking performance, picking the right KPIs is a large one and the third deriving business value for your organization. And is it, you know, is it true business value or is it just a feel good greenwashing type effort? <clears throat> so moving forward, there's, there's a lot of issues we really need to think about in this whole domain of sustainability. <clears throat> 120 million people in China are suffering from malnutrition. <clears throat> a third of children in India are living in extreme <clears throat> poverty. And in Africa, the population growth over the next 10, 20, 30 years is substantial. <clears throat> Where are we going to, get, going to get protein to feed these people, for example? There's a lot of challenges here. Um, <clears throat> food production is very labor, energy, and land intensive. <clears throat> Some challenges remain. <clears throat> and of course, 3 billion people don't have clean fuel around around the world. They're burning wood and other things. <clears throat> so
So <clears throat> our presenters today are Glenn Cook, who's done some incredible work on three-wheel electric vehicles, and even more importantly, legislation here in the state of Florida. <clears throat> Milton Kramer has been focusing for the last few years on port electrification. Uh, I'm not sure Alejandro, he's running a little late, may not be joining us today. Oh, here he is. Hey. <clears throat> even, even better. <laughs> Come on up. <clears throat> How you doing? <clears throat> We, we, we didn't plan that. <laughs> we, didn't, we didn't plan it, but that was good. Yeah. Um, yeah, Alejandro, do you have your slides on a stick? I emailed those and uh, or also have a computer here. They're, they're struggling back there. He's got my so, drive if you want to. <clears throat> and Kurt Ostrodka, who's the smart cities leader at VHB, um, they're, they're about a 2,000 person engineering company up and down the East Coast that have done some truly incredible work. I was very pleasured, uh, uh, honored to be at their annual visioning session up in Manhattan um, two months ago, and I'm sure he's going to have some tremendous insights for us. So <clears throat> in the interest of time, since we are running a little bit late, Milton, come on, Alice, come on up and talk to us about port electrification. So before we get started, just as a show of hands, who here has been in a port or been on a cruise ship? Great, so we all have an idea of where we're headed here. So why do we care about ports? What does that have to do with sustainability, right? Well, for starters, ships are the largest machines on our planet. And the International Maritime Organization did a study that identified shipping as 3% of our global emissions. If we continue with business as usual, by 2050, the maritime industry as a whole will account for over 10% of our greenhouse gases. So that said, let's understand what are the port functions that we're gonna be talking about. So it starts with cruise <clears throat> and then goes to cargo for loading and unloading. There's freight and storage handling once you're on port property. Then there's the distribution of goods upland and then there's maintenance and repair. So from a port standpoint, what is electrification? So we've got all these vessels and vehicles that are on a port and all these things that move around use up diesel fuel for the most part, some natural, some natural, uh, uh, natural gas fuels. But either way, we're looking to replace these fossil fuels with electric power. So how does that relate to sustainability? <clears throat> so we're tapping into our renewable energy resources and reducing our environmental footprint. So I think that's rather apparent. So we're linking all of this together we're reducing our emissions of air pollutants, and also we're reducing our noise pollution to our surrounding communities. So in a port, what type of opportunities are there for this? So it starts at the large end with cruise and cargo vessels, because those are the, some of the major contributors. Then it comes down to the cranes that offload these vessels and smaller cranes that handle stacks of containers around the port, and then you've got the top picks and straddle carriers, trucks and yard hustlers that you know, take containers from here to there around the port. And then of course there are forklifts. And last but not least, we have reefers. Now these aren't the reefers that some of you may be thinking of. These are the kind that plug in and it's basically a refrigerated container that keep our perishables in good condition. So how do we go about this? Well, let's start with the hybrid approach. So a lot of us, are familiar with hybrid vehicles? Well, a lot of these work the same way. The difference might be where a lot of these devices, their engines don't necessarily have enough activity during the day to fully charge the batteries. So we put in electri electrified charging stations to take care of these vessels overnight so they can get their recharge. 
On the fully electric side, you can take things like cruise and cargo ships that don't move around a lot, they come to berth and stay there, they can turn their engines off and plug in with shore power. Then we've got the large cranes that have a limited path that can also plug in and stay plugged in. And then there are the trucks and yard hustlers and shuttle carriers that run around the port carrying containers from here to there. Those guys have quick chargers that can be fully dependent on batteries and do whatever they need to go. And then again, last but not least, we've got reefers where you put in a plug-in station. We can do densified stacks, turn off all generators on site, and all these reefers are now plugged into the electric grid. So how does this, how does this link to supporting renewable energy? <clears throat> so what I'd like to do is share some projects that I've worked on and my team. And I'd like to start with Dominion Portsmouth Marine Terminal. So here we did the master plan for a landside staging site that basically handles the offshore wind farm. So you might say to yourself, well, what does the port have to do with an offshore wind farm? So what they need to do is bring all these large components <clears throat> onto the port property. They stage them, they test them, we do some manufacturing there, and then we assemble them and put them on jack-up barges to get them back out to sea for installation. So how do we go about electrifying this? So the obvious big one is the delivery and installation vessels. So we plug those in with shore power. Then we have electrification components for the testing and the uh, uh, obvious support for the administration buildings, the manufacturing buildings, and of course there's illumination for the site for nighttime operations. So what we've been hearing about also throughout this conference here and there has been digital twin technology. So here we, we had the opportunity to use this in, as it applies to the Esberg Danish seaport. This is the largest throughput port for offshore wind farm staging components in the world. By using digital twin technology, we were able to increase their efficiency and triple their throughput from 1.5 gigawatts all the way up to four and a half. How do we do this? We developed a one-to-one -one simulation of their processes and operations and identified efficiencies and inefficiencies. This allowed the client, with our assistance of course, to analyze all of these operations and maximize these efficiencies before any capital improvements were put into place. So some additional examples that I'd like to go through with you would start with the Port of Palm Beach. Here we did a full master plan of electrification starting all the way from water's edge going upland. We did shore power for crews and cargo ships, electrification for all the cranes, yard hustlers, shuttle carriers, commercial and personal vehicles, all the way up to an electric locomotive that would distribute goods upland. The next one, Port of Tacoma, is out in Washington. And here we actually did the construction documents that are going to be going into construction soon. And this one's a bit near and dear to me because what really sticks out is this recollection that I have of when I went to go visit the site and I'm walking around this cargo port and I'm looking at all these ships lined up and the smoke is bellowing into the air and all these cranes and trucks running around the site burning all this diesel fuel and recognizing that by doing the electrification, we get to eliminate all of that. So here too, we did full electrification. We get to plug in the cargo ships. We get to plug in the cranes. And aside from charging stations for the smaller vehicles, what we got to do here was increase their throughput of refrigeration containers increasing it from just a few hundred containers using densification and electrification, we bumped it up to over 1,200. And this is going to be all without any fossil fuels burning. And last but not least, we have Port Everglades down in South Florida, where we did a master plan for cruise ship shore power. So here, we identified the opportunities and planned it for eight of their cruise terminals to have full shore power, and by, when you look at all the different ships that come into these eight terminals, 
we get to reduce greenhouse gas emissions by 25%. That's equivalent to taking 2,500 cars off the road every single year. <clears throat> so with that, I'd like to just share a little bit about Moffat & Nickel. We're a global engineering consulting firm that we service clients worldwide in the port, maritime, and coastal environments. We have over 45 offices, and we've been around since 1945. And a fun feather in our cap is that we were recently voted by Engineering News Record as the number one design firm in ports and marine environments. And with that, I thank you and welcome any questions for once we're done with our fellow presenters. Awesome. Well, good morning, everyone. Awesome. Uh, my name is Alejandro Burgana. I'm the uh, co-founder and managing director of OVE Power. Let me begin by apologizing to and all of you for my late arrival. I got lost inside the hotel, so it took me a few minutes just to get to the conference room, so I'm sorry about that. But anyway, uh, thanks for your participation and your interest. Uh, we're, we're here to, to share a little bit about best practices uh, on, on EV charging. And just to begin, allow me to make a little bit of an introduction of who we are and what we do. So at OBE Power, we are uh, we have the mission to accelerate the transition to clean and efficient e-mobility. And the way we do that is by trying to solve and anticipate the, uh, the solution to the chicken or the egg dilemma of what comes first, electric vehicles or the charging stations. So the way we are trying to present a solution is by uh, increasing and, and, and implementing and expanding a smart electric vehicle charging network at convenient locations where most people live, work, play, and learn. And we do that under the concept of electric vehicle charging as a service. What that means is that instead of doing what pretty much everyone in the industry is doing, which is selling or leasing charging stations, we're actually investing in uh, qualifying and potential properties where we anticipate good levels of utilization. And we invest by, we invest in the entire turnkey project that includes the electrical make ready, the permitting, the engineering, uh, the installation. We procure and provide the uh, charging equipment, we um, bring our own electrical, uh, I'm sorry, technical platform that is uh, uh, open to both OCPI and OCPP charging stations, meaning that we can integrate charging stations from any brand, such as ChargePoint, uh, ABB, Siemens, EV Box, et cetera. And, um, and we provide a financial incentive where we invest or lower the upfront cost of these uh, qualifying properties. So we bring the charging amenity at no upfront cost to all of them. And then we, um, <clears throat> we secured a long-term exclusive agreement with these properties. So that allows us to, to, to accelerate the adoption or the expansion of the charging network because we lower the entry barriers or the, uh, or the installation or, or the adoption of these uh, charging solutions at these properties. <clears throat> and we make our money back. <clears throat> Sorry, by selling charging sessions and selling a little bit of advertising and subscription. So what we are about to, to, to discuss here today is some of the best practices that we have learned over the last five years of how to pretty much run an, an EV charging business uh, uh, from, from the lessons that we have learned after more than 100,000 charging sessions. So, uh, and today we are getting a charging session in our network uh, every eight minutes. Um, we, we have today uh, 300 and close to 330 or 50 charging points in the state of Florida and Texas. Uh, and, and we secured capital recently to expand 10 times our network over the next three years. Um, <clears throat> we, with that, um, we, as, according as a Bloomberg New Energy Finance, we have also been described as the second largest owned and operated, char operated charging network in the state of Florida after Tesla. So we, have, we own and operate more uh, charging points uh, in the state uh, than uh, EVgo and, and, and Electrify America, which, well, EVgo is a public, uh, you know, $3 billion uh, uh, entity or corporation. And for us being a small company, a startup, a small business, private company, it, it, we feel really proud about that. So with that, we can, uh, you know, talk a little bit about uh, the target customers and, and, and clients that, that we have in our network. So we work directly with municipalities, with Miami-Dade County, the city of Miami, city of Miami Beach, Palm Beach County, um, now with the city of uh, Fort Worth in Texas, 
we also work with major developers like Property Markets Group or the related group with all pretty much all property management companies. And, and we deploy, again, stadiums, university, work, working with the Miami Parking Authority. So the idea is to continue identifying and qualifying a, a locations that will offer a good solution to the drivers, a convenient charging uh, uh, location to the drivers, and at the same time, <clears throat> will provide good levels of utilization. So before we begin talking about <clears throat> some of the best practices, allow me to ask who in the room is already driving electric or is thinking about that? So I can see that maybe half of you are already driving electric. And, um, and for those of you who are not driving electric yet, some good basic reasons, may I know why not you're not doing it yet? Somebody wants to volunteer? Gotta be a truck, I assume, an electric truck for you, right? Yeah, but how many electric trucks are there? They are coming, many. The Rivian, Ford, GM, all of them. But actually, uh, you know, what we have learned by just asking these questions and reading the reports is that there are two major reasons why people are still not confident or haven't made the, the switch yet. First of all, is uh, price and availability of charging or electric vehicles. So those, uh, I mean, uh, just by in 2014, eight years ago, um, uh, the, the cost of an electric car that will deliver more than or close to 300 miles was in an, uh, over $100,000. Those were the Tesla Model S and pretty much, and then every, everything else will deliver between 150 and 200 miles per charge, not enough. Today, thanks to advance in battery technology and the reduction of uh, you know, the cost of manufacturing batteries from $1,000 a kilowatt hour to less than 200, right now the average is about 180, you can purchase, you can lease an electric vehicle with an average price of 35, 40, 45 in that, in that price range that will deliver between 250 and 300 miles. So there are many options. In fact, there are more than 40 alternatives of electric vehicles, brands and models that you can purchase or acquire today. Uh, true, they are not available. There is not an inventory at dealers. You need to pre-order them and wait for a few months. But yes, there are plenty of options today that you can do it. So that, that's option number one. There is nothing we can do about that, but just wait for you know, the, the mass production of more electric vehicles by all car manufacturers or OEM. But the second most important reason, the second biggest barrier to EV adoption is again, the access to a conveniently located, affordable uh, 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 you know, and, and reliable charging network. And this is where we are actually trying to present and build a solution to accelerate that transition. So uh, the second part of the question is uh, uh, there is this uh, misconception about like charging an electric car takes too long. I believe that most of you will agree and think about that like, oh, it takes forever to charge. But let me ask you, do you think that DC fast or, or fast charging is better than AC or level two charging? And do you know the difference, AC, level two? Okay, would you think that DC fast is Definitely better. But you say yes. So people are, you know, you see all the headlines in the industry about, you know, chargers that are going from 150 kilowatts to 200 up to 350 kilowatts an hour. That's good enough to fully charge a vehicle in eight minutes about it. Um, but reality is that it's not every electric vehicle is capable of handling that level of power input to the batteries. And at the same time, uh, we need to, I invite all of you to think about these questions in a different way. Because uh, you know, when people are demanding, the market is demanding for, for faster charging, is trying to think or, or to compare the, the charging action, the fueling action to when people go to the gas station, that takes three, four minutes to fill the tank. So if you're trying to, to analyze uh, or, or evaluate the charging experience from the perspective of the pump, uh, then you you will find out that charging an electric car sometimes takes too long. But if we think about that in a different fashion, I mean, people on the left, they are charging at level two. And people on the right, actually, I took that picture yesterday afternoon at the uh, Fort Pierce uh, gas station where there is also plenty of charger from both uh, Tesla and FPL. People, <coughs> the, the picture on the right, are people that are charging fast 
but they are sitting inside their cars, <clears throat> texting, waiting for that vehicle to reach a level of charging <clears throat> that will allow them to complete the, uh, the journey or the trip. Well, people on the left, they're actually living their life while their vehicles are being charged. If we had charging stations here in this hotel, my car will be charging while we are doing this uh, presentation and having this conversation. So the point here is that let's realize that vehicles spend, car spends like 80% of their life sitting on the parking lot. So th this is the best time where you can actually plug in and fully charge the vehicle while you are living your life, whether it is playing sports, uh, you know, having a, 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 a work meeting or even sleeping and charging overnight and waking up every morning to a fully charged battery. In addition to all of that, actually, when you see uh, the, uh, the the level two charging, that little icon on the left, it is the connection, the, the, the port, the J1772 port, which is universal. And it's good to charge any electric vehicle in the market, including Tesla's with the little adapter that comes with the vehicle. Now, when, you, when we move to the DC fast charging, actually, we have a little bit of a problem to solve here. We have three ports or three connectors the Tesla connector, the Charimo, and the CCS or combo connector. Uh, Tesla has their own, you know, Japanese uh, vehicles, including Nissan and Mitsubishi that come with Charimo and everything else. Americans and Europeans use the, uh, <clears throat> the CCS or combo. So depending on the brand of your vehicle and the make, you will have to choose from this station or that station. <clears throat> so that actually creates a problem that is not being solved in the next uh, three to five years until we find a universal charger that will be good for, or, or port that will be good for all electric vehicles for DC fast charging. Now, based on more than 100,000 charging sessions, uh, you know, hundreds of thousands of charging hours, data that we have collected, and trying to compare all of that with data coming from, study from McKinsey and Blue, Bloomberg New Energy Finance, the average charging session <coughs> consumes 22.7 kilowatts hours. A level two charging, that takes about three hours of charging, and that's good for 75 miles of range. So again, people usually ask, well, I just got a Tesla that has a 100 kilowatt uh, battery. So how long it takes to fully charge my vehicle for, from empty to full? And, and the answer is like, well, that situation almost never happened. I mean, actually people are plugging in when they reach like 40% of battery capacity and they charge up up to 80% and they are trying to, you know, to move around city between 40 and 80%. Charging on a daily basis at level two charging and that charging session lasts three hours on average, regardless of the brand and model of your vehicle. We keep the data, we analyze the data, we're trying to see, well, what are the charging patterns of people who drive Nissan Leaf or Chevy Bolts versus those who drive you know, a Tesla Model S or Y? They are all the same. Everybody on average drive a charge for three hours at the, and the energy consumption is 22.7 kilowatts an hour. That is consistent whether you are charging at the office, the university, at the hospital, or overnight at home. Same charging patterns. Then another typical question, uh, uh, when we are trying to conduct a negotiation about installing a new charging solution, let's say for a condominium or a rental community, then uh, after they have uh, approved and, and, and authorized uh, the, the contract and the agreements and the terms of the business, then the next question is, well, how many charging points are we going to install here or there? Uh, the, the position from, from, from the property manager is usually like, well, we conducted a survey we have uh, seven people uh, driving electric today, and uh, we are also learning that about nine people are expecting to purchase or get their new electric vehicle in the next uh, six to eight months. So we need 15 charging points or charging stations. Well, I say, well, actually, what we, the solution that we actually trying to present here is community charging as a service. It is meant to be shared. So the reality is that if we learn from the previous slide that the uh, average charging session lasts three hours, it's usually one, we can see that as a one charging session in the morning and another one in the afternoon. So the reality is that one charging point is good to be shared among 7.5 electric vehicles. And, and the picture that we have here 
is a dual port charging station. So that station is good to be shared for 15 residents in the same community. So all of them can share without friction, without competition, without having to discuss, oh, I need to charge now, get out of here. No, no, no. Actually, a dual port charging session is good to meet the, the charging needs of 15 residents in the same community or 15 employees in the same uh, working place or, you know, people that are constantly charging on a daily basis, on a regular basis to, to move around and to, do, to meet their community needs. So that's important in order to, to understand how big or small should be a charging project for a given location. Then um, another question, I think that in 2023, this is already obvious, but that is actually was a big discussion a few years back. It's like, should I install dumb chargers, which is simply an outlet with a port to, to, full, to connect your vehicle, or should I use smart chargers? Back in the day, the price difference uh, was so large that some people were still saying, no, I don't want to pay for that. I don't, to, I don't need the technology. Why do I need so many reports? I just want a port to, to charge my vehicle, and that's it. Reality is that in order to have a good charging practice and, and operation, you need to have smart chargers that are cloud connected. And part of the solution we bring to the table to every single customer is the possibility to offer your drivers an, an, an app that they will use to find the charging stations, to make reservations, to get access codes, to, to pay for the charging stations. And even if all the ports are being used, even to wait list or, or reserve or actually get a report and a receipt after every charging session. But then, in addition to all of that, the technology platform allows to provide each one of the hosts with a portal, uh, uh, a kind of a, a dashboard that well, they will use to see how many ports are being used, how many ports are available, the level of uh, power consumption, uh, if you can compare the, the level of usage or utilization between uh, chargers that are on the east side of the building versus uh, the west side. You can use all of that in order to anticipate uh, what is the optimal charging uh, location and solution. So those reports even allow us to, to, say, to, to track uh, savings in greenhouse gases and even to compensate our customers, uh, fleet uh, managers, municipalities with carbon credit income based on, on savings on those greenhouse gases. We estimate or assign a value to, to every metric ton of, ga of, uh, of greenhouse gases saved from the environment, and we share that uh, revenue with, with each one of the hosts. Then this is a, a good representation of a typical uh, location where people live, mostly you know, multifamily, condominiums, rental communities, we begin with with properties that are big enough to have a critical mass of drivers and vehicles to justify the upfront investment. And with more people adopting and driving electric, then we are kind of lowering the entry barrier. And those, each one of these properties has more than 300 units, but now we are going down to 200 and that will meet the, the, the minimum demand to justify the upfront investment. And with, with um, uh, uh, the adoption of electric vehicles going from five to seven in the coming years of new vehicles sold, then we can even lower that to maybe uh, buildings with 100 units. So this is a, a, a typical representation of some of our locations of workplaces, uh, places, customers where, where we deploy charging stations for the benefit of those who work over there. Same with municipalities, stadiums, hospitals. Uh, I mean, uh, we're actually pretty good at, at delivering uh, charging solutions to municipalities and fleet managers. So another incredibly important consideration, and, and I want to be very clear here, is that driving electric and, and charging an electric vehicle has to be, must be cheaper than driving on gas. And why do I say that? Is that uh, in this uh, slide, we have uh, uh, you know, the cost per mile or, of driving a, a gas mobile or, electric, or typical internal combustion engine vehicle at the average price of, ga of, of, of gasoline per gallon here today in Orlando. So the average is uh, $3.40. And, 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 and with that, and, and assuming that according to the Department of Energy and, and Transportation, uh, the average uh, uh, fuel efficiency of, of uh, internal combustion vehicles sold in the United States last year is about 24 miles uh, per gallon. That gives us the driving on, on gasoline today cost about 14 cents per mile. Now, there are companies, 
that are also offering uh, charging solutions. One of them is uh, Blink, for example, they are charging 49 cents per kilowatt an hour. And that is even more expensive than driving on gas. In our opinion, that is a terrible practice. I mean, you are delivering the wrong message here. They are trying to profit from, from pretty much those who are the early adopters and the people trying to drive electric. Then we have uh, companies that, like Tesla, they have successfully deployed the supercharging network across the entire country. Actually, their, their charging solution is Paramount, is the best in the industry. And they, they started at 22 cents, incredibly low, and even free charging when they were early in the game. Now they are charging about 41 cents a kilowatt an hour, which is equal to, to, to 12 cents per mile. That is assuming that any electric vehicle delivers about 3.4 miles for every kilowatt hour. And then this is uh, our charging rate, our commercial charging rate, which is uh, 36 cents a kilowatt an hour, which is equivalent to 10 cents a mile. So with that, people are actually saving 25% on fueling cost. And that's important, particularly for, you know, for every driver who drives, I don't know, between 12 and 15,000 miles a year, or for fleet managers who are always trying to have like, like paste a uh, fueling cost or, or save a lot of money in fueling cost. Well, this is a very effective way actually to not only help the environment and reduce uh, your carbon footprint from transportation, but also to save a lot of money in fueling costs. So taking some of these uh, lessons learned and, and best practices uh, over the years, this is how we have achieved what we, as far as we know, is the highest utilization rate in the industry. Um, so, because when you are going to own and operate a charging network, it is all about the utilization and the reason why is because since we are making our money back from, from collecting charging fees from drivers, we need to deploy at places where we are expecting good levels of utilization. And this is our average utilization year over year. When we started back in 2017 having one or two percent utilization, people call us nuts, crazy, stupid, everything, like we will never make our money back, but we knew that people at some point will start adopting and buying and using these electric vehicles and they needed to charge. So today our average utilization and by you know practicing this uh, set of basic uh, common sense rules of where to deploy and how many and what type of chargers, we have reached an average utilization of 11.3%, which is actually twice as high as, as uh, the utilization from EVgo, which again is a public company worth $3 billion in the market today. So those are with that level of utilization, we are able to make our money back in 3.5 years, and that is allowing us to pretty much uh, uh, get more access to capital to continue accelerating and, and expanding the charging network. Uh, with that, I believe that we conclude our presentation, and I'm open to questions about charging practices or the network or managing this uh, charging business. Thank you. All right, good morning, everyone. I thought it was gonna be less, so that was a surprise, Jim. <laughs> All right, so um, Alejandro and, and Milton have done a great job setting the stage. Um, uh, I always recommend to my clients, especially municipal ones, don't purchase your own chargers. Actually pick up the phone and call someone like Alejandro, um, because if, especially if you're using federal funds, you're gonna own and have to maintain those chargers for 10, 20 years. Um, what happens when level four comes out? So folks like Alejandro have a, they actually have an incentive to keep improving their technology. Um, so think about that as you are thinking about your own charging networks. Um, so a uh, couple, couple of ground uh, stats to start. Uh, the transportation sector in the US uses the plurality about 29% of our, or produces uh, uh, for greenhouse gas emissions uh, and personal vehicles, it's hard to read these charts, uh, account for more than half of that. Mm -hmm. So there's really an immediate opportunity if we can get our friends from, from Colorado to also change over to uh, electric vehicles to make a little, little bit of change in addition to the other efforts to, for uh, port electrification uh, and everything else. So, you know, great near-term opportunity for us. Um, I think everybody knows that the, uh, the, the onslaught of vehicles is gonna continue. I'm, I'm pretty excited to see uh, the Super Bowl this weekend and see if, again, every car manufacturer is uh, uh, promoting electric vehicles. Um, we've even seen uh, from a, a state level, uh, California is going to ban new internal combustion engines or, or ICEs uh, by 2035. Uh, the state of Washington followed suit. I think I saw that the state of Montana said they were going to phase out electric vehicles 
by 2035, I'm not sure if they're trying to troll the, the industry um, and, and pander to the, the oil and gas, but Wyoming. Wyoming, thank you. Thank you. Um, but we're at a really uh, you know, transformative time uh, from a funding perspective. Uh, everybody, of course, knows about uh, IJA and the bipartisan infrastructure law. Um, so that's going to be, be providing some real money, $7.5 billion for electric vehicle charging throughout the country. Um, there's two different pots of money that I'll go through. Uh, the first one is called the NEVI program, so that's the National Electric Vehicle Infrastructure Program, uh, which is going to put out $5 billion, again, that's with a B, uh, for uh, essentially the highways. Um, the really great thing about this is that it, while it covers 80% of uh, uh, eligible project costs, that can be either to public or to private. So it's not all going to public agencies. A public agency can contra contract an Alejandro to put in uh, charging infrastructure. So that's a good thing that allows for um, flexibility in markets. And again, it doesn't require a, a DOT who has no experience owning and operating and maintaining electrical infrastructure to be able to contract that out as a service. Um, the uh, FHWA is going to distribute that through state uh, federal funding uh, formulas, and then the states have created all their own plans to determine how to use that. Uh, the other pot of money that's not on there, because uh, you're probably wondering what happened to the other $2.5 billion, that is going into what's called a discretionary program. So that is actually the pot that's more interesting for me because that's how communities can use uh, uh, charging. Um, the, the previous one is really going to help us build out what they call alternative fuel corridors. So think of highways, major um, county and state roads. Uh, the other part will go into competitive grants for uh, communities. So uh, areas that uh, are already underserved can have the opportunity to provide access to charging where it doesn't exist today. Uh, this is a breakdown of, of how that funding is being distributed. Um, again, the, uh, the blue is the, uh, essentially what's going to go on the highways. And then the green are the disc discretionary grants uh, that will go to uh, you know, community organizations. Uh, it's not all about cars, though. Uh, the, uh, the, the legislature will also provide uh, a pretty uh, substantial amount of funding for, uh, for public transit, and I assume also for, for the, the shipping industry, which is great. Um, you know, we need to continue to invest in, in all different modes, not just uh, personal vehicles. So taking, uh, you know, buses, uh, you know, th you think about large school bus fleets, you think about um, the Postal Service actually just made an announcement that they're going to invest in electric vehicles for their fleet. Uh, and then, uh, you know, many, many people uh, actually still do ride the bus in urban areas. Um, so, you know, this could have a transformative impact in those areas that are already, you know, fairly congested and uh, have poor air quality outcomes. Uh, we'll not go through this whole chart. Uh, the important thing to know is that we are, are we have already had all the states complete their deployment plans. So you can, uh, if, if you're not from Florida, you can look up your own state and see what uh, the plans are. It has to be very transparent in how the money is being spent. We're at the stage right now where the, the grant uh, programs and money is, is starting to be uh, rolled out um, once the FHWA approved uh, the, those state plans. So keep an eye uh, within your, in your state of what's going on for funding opportunities uh, because it's better to have money than not have money. All right, uh, I think most of us here are from Florida. Um, if you're not aware, Florida is the second highest uh, rate of EV ownership uh, behind only California. Um, uh, thanks to Alejandro and, and his uh, compatriots, we do have a, a pretty good network already of existing uh, charging facilities. I think the probably also the second most in the country. Um, and then we're eligible to receive uh, almost $200 million of those NEVI highway funds uh, over the next five years. So I think many of you that are, that are on the fence about you know, having range anxiety of your electric vehicle will soon have range confidence that you can get where you need to go and have uh, adequate charging along the way. Uh, this is a copy of, of Florida's uh, NEVI deployment plan. So if you're interested, take a look at this and see where you live in the state, where they're uh, programming charging. A lot of this was looking at gaps in the network and where you should uh, fill those. But I, I want to point out the dark areas here on the map. So uh, is anybody aware of uh, Justice 40? Not yet. You, you'll hear about this a lot more. 
Um, so these are, this is an initiative, it's actually federal law, um, that requires uh, essentially benefits to be provided uh, in an equitable way to all communities. So as states are looking at the deployment of uh, infrastructure, they want to make sure that those gray areas that are called, that are classified as disadvantaged communities are not left behind. So uh, I'm an urban planner by trade. I, I happen to get into um, smart cities maybe by accident. Um, but so I, I always go back to kind of the needs of the people within the community and how we're going to arrange things from a, um, you know, a, a land use perspective, how the transportation options all work together, uh, what, are, what kind of businesses we're trying to support. And I think these are the things that, that you all in the audience and we all on this panel need to think about. So what kind of land use changes do we need to support this infrastructure? Um, it, was, it was mentioned before that if you have a, all multifamily, that you're not likely to have a garage where you can put your own charger station in. So think about that from a, a land use perspective. Uh, I talked about equity and, and access to, uh, to chargers as well. Um, what kind of amenities do you want at your site? There's a, there's a great site that I, I take uh, when I'm driving my, my Tesla up north in, in Lake City. It's in the, the back of a Waffle House. Um, you know, my, my family has gotten accustomed to going there. Uh, that my kids love the uh, scrambled, uh, color, covered, smothered. Uh, but, <laughs> but for a while, like, we weren't sure if we wanted to go in there and use the bathroom. Um, there's, you know, we're, we're still building out the overall network and the amenities at a site can make a big difference. Uh, whether it's, it's shade, a picnic table, because you're going to try and in these charging stops, you're going to try to you know eat your meals at that point. Uh, not having a trash can at these sites is actually a big deal because then you have to either bring it all with you or unfortunately people will, will leave it behind, which isn't a, a great outcome. Um, think about how we can engage stakeholders in this process is of, of course important because it's the community's vision we need to implement. And then asset repositioning. What's going to happen with gas stations? What's going to happen with uh, older malls? How can they actually provide better value for their customers is a question we want to help answer. Uh, so when, when we at VHB look at this, we look at kind of three different phases. So there's an overall needs assessment. So how does, uh, how does your community already function in terms of charging? Do you have uh, available chargers or not? Uh, are they located in the right places along major corridors or employers? Um, you know, so try to understand what you have already. Uh, next part is stakeholder engagement. So actually talking to your community about their needs, what their, what their vision is for electrification. There's gonna be some communities that say, we actually need more uh, micromobility. So we need e-scooters, we need e-bikes um, e because we're actually trying to shift modes away from personal uh, automobiles. So understanding what um, those, uh, you know, the, the community purpose is, is, is very, very important. And then you get into the design recommendations. So you can look at things from a site specific assessment. So I've, I've selected a site, here's the steps I need to take, whether it's uh, choosing my equipment, uh, coordinating with utility, uh, deciding what kind of amenities and design I wanna put on the site. Or you can do, uh, if you're a large institutional user, uh, what's the, the fleet assessment needs you can use to um, update your, um, your, 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 your fleet? You know, what's the, the return on investment, life cycle of your current system? Uh, these are all things that, um, that, that you and we can help to answer uh, together. Um, so a couple of examples I'll walk through. Um, uh, we're working right now for Orange County, which you're sitting in today. Uh, on their uh, electric vehicle and mobility hub. Uh, Orange County is about uh, 3 million people, residents. Uh, Glenn and I are both residents. Uh, and we actually receive about 60 million visitors every year. And you can, you can guess why with the theme parks and you're all probably amongst them. Um, so we are helping them uh, to achieve one of their sustainability goals uh, through uh, planning for mobility and electric vehicle hubs. Um, so we did a countywide analysis. Again, it's a pretty big place. Um, Orlando, City of Orlando proper is right in the middle and then we're somewhere down here. Uh, so we wanted to map out all of the existing chargers, if, if it was level two or level three, draw some buffers around them uh, so we could see within you know, a five mile buffer or a, a 25 mile buffer, do we have adequate coverage for existing users? And then that helped us to identify the gaps. We ended up selecting, I think it was 10 different public sites 
um, because this was a county project, they wanted all the sites to be on county property rather than trying to do a, a, any kind of joint venture or on a, in a, on a private site. Um, essentially, they wanted a very turnkey solution where they didn't have to ask permission from anybody else uh, to, to use the land. Uh, so we tried to make sure they were distributed uh, throughout the uh, throughout the, the community uh, based on some of that that buffer mapping I showed you earlier. We also used uh, what the county calls their access and opportunity map, um, which is a system that they use to map uh, uh, low income uh, housing needs and employment needs together, uh, as well as disadvantaged communities. So again, we're trying to make sure that the access to charging uh, is, is equitable throughout the area. So I'll walk you through a, one of our uh, examples. Um, this is uh, the Sun, Meadowwoods Sunrail Station. Uh, so Sunrail is our commuter rail system uh, that's about um, 80 some miles. We're, we're expecting a, a connection to the airport uh, very soon. Um, this is a, uh, a, obviously a large parking lot. Uh, the, the nuance here is that these sites are actually owned by DOT, but will be converted to some ownership in the very near future. They're not exactly sure if it's gonna be Lynx, the local transit agency that will end up operating SunRail or not. That's still kind of up in the air. Uh, but we knew it was an important multimodal hub. And we knew we wanted to have something here because it would be kind of foolish not to utilize the, the existing resource um, and, and make sure we can, we can service this as a regional site. Um, so kind of like Alejandro mentioned, we, we do have a mix of level two and level three charging here. Uh, you would not want to use level three if you're getting on a train to go somewhere for the whole day because your, your car will be done in, in 30 minutes. Um, so that's why we wanted to have a, a combination of level two and level three and, and have that mix. So the level three will help uh, pass through uh, regional traffic. Level two will be for uh, you know, commuters that are gonna be there for several hours. Um, we did provide uh, some, some capital costs, um, but again, we're not recommending to Orange County that they purchase anything. We want them to use those NEVI funds uh, to um, either do a, a lease agreement or a, a charger as a services agreement, um, because if they purchase them, then they'll have to maintain them for 10 years and we don't want them to be stuck with a bunch of level twos when you know level five comes out and because nobody will use it. Um, I'm, I'm actually gonna skip this one because I wanna make sure we have time for everybody, but we're also working with some campus and institutional users uh, to help them uh, develop uh, fleet transition plans uh, so um, that they can, again, try to meet their own sustainability goals as well as some of their um, meet the demands of not really the students, the students don't own EVs, but their parents do and wanna have them when they come to visit. Um, I'll end with this one. This is in Richmond, Virginia, uh, Dominion Energy, uh, Clean Energy Park. Very cool redevelopment site. This is located downtown. Uh, the uh, Dominion building is right here and they've got solar shades over their parking spaces and I didn't realize this at first, but it's in the Dominion logo, the way they designed it. Uh, they want this to be a very interpretive and educational site. So rather than hiding the transformers and the electric <coughs> equipment, they're actually putting it out in the open so people can see how it's used. Um, so in addition to the solar uh, panels, they, they have a kind of an environmental ethos of uh, collecting rainwater that comes off of that, which is then reused in irrigation for the park. Um, there are 29 charging spaces there, uh, three different tenants. I'm not supposed to say which ones they are, but you can probably guess of the, the, the three big, uh, or some of the more nationally known uh, charging providers. Um, again, they didn't want it to be specific to one company, but show it how it could be a demonstration and kind of a lab uh, for all different uh, chargers uh, to, to work together. And what I love about this is that it's not just a parking lot. It's, it's an actual park that people can use in downtown Richmond understand how renewable energy is used. I think they have a couple demonstration wind turbines uh, that on, on site as well, um, because they wanna be a good steward of, of the environment and show how renewable energy uh, can, can actually have a direct impact on people's lives and how they commute around. Um, there's a park, an amphitheater, just a lot of different green space, which again, if you're used to charging at the uh, Waffle House parking lot, this is, will be a big difference. 
Uh, so some things I want to just close with. Most of us only drive 20 to 30 miles a day. So very easy to recharge either overnight or every couple days. Um, most of us are not driving hundreds of miles a day. So it's, it's important to kind of put that in context. Um, while I love having a, a car that has 330 miles of uh, potential charge and never actually gets it because I have a heavy foot, um, <laughs> most of us don't go that far every day. Um, I, I mentioned a, uh, you know, can make sure you consider the, the ground lease versus purchase. I would really um, think about a, a lease agreement or a service agreement with uh, EVs. Um, if any of you are in real estate, um, now's the time to think about whether you want to build EV capable or EV ready parking spaces uh, rather than not do anything in your parking lots. Uh, so EV ready or EV capable means you put some conduit underground. You don't have to actually install the charger, but when you're ready to do that, you already have the, uh, the underground uh, infrastructure taken care of. And then you can have a company come and put the above ground uh, uh, equipment there. So if you're going to think about doing this, it's obviously much cheaper to do it up uh, ahead of time rather than to, you know, dig up and rebuild. Um, so think about that uh, because your customers and your residents and your clients are going to start de uh, uh, demanding it as they see these Super Bowl ads for new EVs. Um, amenities are important. Uh, nobody likes to sit in their car texting uh, in, 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 in bright sunlight. So think about how when I drive with my family and I want my kids to get out and run around a little bit, um, I don't want them running around just in a parking lot with broken glass. You know, to have a park, uh, you know, maybe some uh, some tables, some playground equipment. You know, those can make a big factor in uh, how you um, how people experience the journey. And then finally, start coordinating with your utility today. Uh, you probably have heard about supply chain issues. Transformers are uh, backed up. I've heard anywhere between you know, 18 months to four years. Um, so it's not too early to start talking about uh, how you can work with the supply side as you, um, you know, plan for your electric future. So with that, um, happy to answer questions at, at the end and I'll turn it back over to Jim. Thanks, Derek. My name is Glenn Cook. I am the founder and CEO of EV Transports. Uh, basically, I'm a one-on-one -on -one consulting firm, part of a venture capital company here in Central Florida known as Merging Traffic and also the Blockchain Consortium. What we do is we work with companies anywhere from startup level all the way through uh, Russell 2000 companies. And what we try to do is bring them to market, hitting a lot of the pain points in the EV, autonomy, infrastructure, legislative space. So if you look over here to the left, you see the gentleman at the top sitting here with me, that's Mr. Mark Reed, he owns a company right up underneath of us, it's called BEEP. That's the first and largest autonomous vehicle shuttle fleet in the world. They just won the uh, uh, Institute of Technology Transportation Award for uh, a service that we provide right here in Lake Nona. And we transport people autonomously throughout the city of Lake Nona. We call Lake Nona our living lab because we get a chance to experiment and try things that most cities in the world can't do, okay? So if you notice on the both sides of that beep vehicle there, there's some regular looking vehicles. There's a couple Teslas there and there's also a Lincoln. Those vehicles are anywhere from level two to level four autonomy here in the state of Florida. Bottom right corner, that's a part of the old study that I was with the National Limousine Association Board of Directors at the time. The young lady with me, that's my wife. Uh, what we did is we brought legislation into the National Limousine Association, helped them to win grant monies to be able to move their uh, legislative efforts forward up in D.C. And we're not moving. How about? Which one? We just moved. There, oh, there we yeah, go. Yeah, there we go. That one. Perfect. All right. So EV Transports, we've also started working with some other international companies now. Uh, Mobility Insights is out of Tel Aviv, Hapa, Israel. They basically are a simulation and training company to collect data. So my part of my background is being a scientist. Don't I look like a scientist? I'm doing developmental research for safety, for electrification, autonomy, infrastructure, legislative stuff throughout the state, also throughout our nation, as also now working with international companies to bring them here to our Central Florida area. Mobility Insights happens to be a simulation and training company for the intelligent mobility center that we're bringing to Lake Nona into our 5G lab. 
So it's going to be real-time data that they're going to be working with our infrastructure, our legislators, our real-time electric autonomous infrastructure to be able to collect that data and give that out to our state, our uh, municipalities, our governance over the area to make, help allow them to make smarter decisions with the capital that we're going to be bringing in from the IRA bill. Also from a program uh, like Kurt's going to be working with, it's going to be called Moving Florida Forward. It's a $7 billion uh, appropriation that we're going to be getting here to our state. So before we start making decisions with our capital, we're going to be able to utilize this uh, software from Mobility Insight, who also was the creator of Waze. These guys are the guys that created Waze, sold it to Google 20 plus years ago, and we're going to utilize this new Mobility Insight software to simulate human behavior, road patterns. If there's an event in an area where there's a crash, how do you restructure how your city moves and breathes through our mobility solutions? So we're going to be able to do that with Mobility Insight. Some of my background, we actually started EV transports years ago with this little bitty company called Tesla. And what we would do is, is we would get people in these vehicles and we would move them throughout our city through our conferences. We would move them for our theme parks, in and out of the airport. And what we did is we took data from all this. We did over 4,000 trips back when basically electrification and autonomy wasn't cool yet. It wasn't anything that people were talking about. So we collected all this data into our university system. And we even worked with Give Kids the World. That little gentleman down at the bottom right there was actually at the Arnold Palmer um, medical facility years ago. And that's his dad. But right, He's a doctor out of Israel, and that's their nurse. EV Transports basically decided that we were going to work on the world's transition through electrification and autonomy and getting people more organized and, and more uh, educated in the space so they would become more comfortable with utilizing electric vehicles. So they would learn how to ride inside a partially autonomous vehicle before they made that jump into a level four, level five autonomous vehicle. On the right, you see there's an iceberg there. That's part of our venture capital company. Most people think about uh, cryptocurrencies and blockchain that it has to deal with Bitcoin or it has to deal with Ethereum. Well, actually what blockchain does is it does all those things up underneath that iceberg. That's what we deal with with blockchain. It is a secure type of transaction that we can uh, be able to monitor and be able to look at all things that have to do with the Internet of Things, medical, uh, education, transportation, cyber security and finance. And it's a trusted contract. That's what blockchain is. And because we are part of that venture capital community, we can utilize blockchain to support other businesses within our community. Dr. David Metcalf here on the right, he's part of uh, my mentorship program at the University of Central Florida. He's also former NASA. Uh, he's part of our blockchain consortium as well as merging traffic. As you can see over here on the left, merging traffic and the blockchain ventures corporation those are all the companies that are in our portfolio that we currently work with right now throughout the state of Florida, internationally, as well as uh, right here locally, some of those companies. This is part of the process that we do at the uh, University of Central Florida. It's called the i -Corp program. i -Corp basically works with different types of level businesses that are startups, and we bring them to fruition throughout our incubators. If you notice right here, you got a picture of me standing in front of our life sciences incubator. That is actually over there in Lake Nona in the Guidewell building. So that's mainly my corporate office. Uh, down here at the bottom left, you see this company right there. It's called Arkimoto. Arkimoto was one of the very first three-wheel electric vehicles to be able to build a platform at two-thirds less the cost and hit 85% of all mobility needs. So we brought them here to the state of Florida about three years ago during COVID to be able to study them, to be able to teach them to teach us and us to teach them what the key pain points are for mobility. And we also found that we could take that platform that they developed in Eugene, Oregon, and we could blend it into autonomy and be able to reduce the cost of their manufacturing by two thirds. So we could hit 85% of all mobility needs, two thirds less the cost of operation and manufacturing and have it be totally sustainable, zero fossil fuels, okay? Then down here at the bottom right corner, you can see that that's the College of Engineering out at UCF. They actually took that platform and made it part of our data study for the state of Florida. So we're working with Dr. Hassan, Dr. Adi's team on safety also, hence the shirt, Safe Rider. That is part of our trademark, and we are working on now reducing fatalities, working with our cities 
on reducing the size of how our roadway structures are developed, creating the cities of the future, okay? Right here, you see one of the vehicles right there in front of the uh, fire station. We also have the beep shuttle for the Move Nona program. The one on the right is known as the rapid responder. The one on the left is known as the FUV. Both of those vehicles are supported by the uh, University of Central Florida. And up on the right, you'll see the future is now, thanks to House Bill 1289. That's part of the legislative language that we worked on during COVID to bring the auto cycle to life. There was never language created in the state of Florida for a three-wheel electric vehicle. There's always the motorcycle and the car or the automobile. Now there's actually a language and a terminology. So basically Scott Randolph's office or our tax collector can make money off the registration. So the auto cycle bill now is a three-wheel electric vehicle that operates on two independent electric motors on the front and one third wheel in the rear. What we did also strategically for this house bill is we worked with Senator Brandis we work with Representative Placencia, Fiona McFarland, David Santiago, and we created language for, for the vehicle of the future, the auto cycle of the future for an autonomous auto cycle. So it will actually go from a manually manipulated vehicle, which is actually very fun to ride, solves the problem of last mile capabilities, also solves the problem of delivery services. So we wrote the language for the autonomous auto cycle bill 1289 past the house and the Senate unanimously signed by our governor into law 2021 in July. These are basically the form factors that I was telling you about for the auto cycle. If you notice on the right how you got three wheels and, the, and you got the two in the front where the electric motor is, one in the rear. Uh, part of the auto cycle language, you have to have an, a steering mechanism, not a steering wheel. What it also does, as we found through our uh, study, is that by not utilizing a steering wheel, it gives you an extra depth away from your sternum. So should you have an incident, should you have an impact, you don't have to worry about the front crushing into the sternum and causing more trauma than necessary. We also found that by building the base of the manufacturing process, kind of like a Ford chassis, you can stick whatever shell you want on top of it, and 90% of the manufacturing is that base. So 90% is the base, you stick the shell on the top and it also helps you to cut the costs on the manufacturing process. If you notice on the right also, uh, you have a lot more componentry in the manufacturing. On the bottom, we work with Sandy Monroe and Associates up in uh, Detroit, Michigan to be able to optimize the manufacturing process. Also cut down about 200 pounds worth of materials, which also cuts down on the manufacturing process to optimize the manufacturing. The very bottom left, we talked about the autonomous driving platform that has been built to be able to be able to be driven either by drive by wire, and it's also ultra efficient. So as we were talking about earlier about the charging aspects of these vehicles, because they're ultra efficient, a normal Tesla probably gets about 120 miles per gallon equivalency to a normal automobile. These vehicles right here, because there's less mass, actually operate at about 175 miles per gallon efficiency level. And on top of that, instead of getting 22 miles per hour on a level two charger, these things can get 40 miles. Ultra efficient. So you decrease your rechargeability time, you increase your operability, and you decrease the componentry that has to be manufactured as well. Well, some of the other things that we've done, we've worked with UCF on creating new vertiports. Some people have heard about Lilium coming into town. The schematic on the left was actually something we worked with the airport on years and years ago before there ever was a thought of Lilium of how we would create vertiports with electrification. And like we were talking about up on the, the panel up here, you got to give people something to do while you're recharging your vehicle, even if it's for 10 or 15 minutes. And so these things that we talked about with the airport was, oh, we can bring in food trucks. We can have a doggy area for, for walking our dogs. Uh, the recharge area, we also have a hotel area. On the right, we work with OUC during the VW mitigation process. How do we spend that capital better? When we have to build these recharge hubs of the future, what is that gonna look like? How do we optimize sustainability? We put in the solar structure. We put in the additional battery, uh, what they call microgrid battery packs. So at that same time, you optimize your city, you optimize your flow, and you can be able to do that in any given urban environment. Now then, because we are Lake Nona, we call ourselves the Living Lab. My office is actually out there at the Guywell Innovation Building. So we help Tavistock to create the cities of the future. And it's not only Lake Nona. 
If you notice to the right over here, our game plan is not only going to be to work on Lake Nona, but it's also going to be the Sunbridge area between Osceola and Orange County. That's actually going to be that Sunbridge area. It's not started um, a lot of its uh, development yet, but it's going to be between Orange County, Osceola County, and it's going to extend from the south side of Orange County into Osceola and go as far north as the 528, almost up into Avalon Park. So we're going to be able to create from the ground up the cities of the future with the appropriate fiber optics, reduce the size of the infrastructure for the cities, making sure that we have the recharge hubs, even create some of the roads that we can have type of regenerative charging built into the roads. The platforms of charging in the future might be level three, level four, level five. However, we can also have types of wireless charging so when you park your autonomous vehicle or you park your electric vehicle somewhere it actually will charge through a base directly into it so you don't have to worry about plugging it in anymore it's just some of the ways that we're trying to be forward thinking and we're already working on cities of the future plans for 2045 2050 how do we create that infrastructure so we don't have to dig up the dirt twice Part of the infrastructure and management systems is going to be multimodal in the future. If you notice here on the left, this is a company we work with called Omnimodal with the city of Orlando for a safe rider project. This uh, project on the left actually is sunsetted since now. But the safe rider is actually a name that is built as a code word throughout the entire central Florida area all the way into Space Coast. Um, and it's a, it's, the idea basically is to reduce the amount of fatalities lower the risk for any types of incidents you might have on the road. And we've been also working with Mobility Insight to simulate the multimodal systems. Everything from your transit system, your air system, your train system, your electrification of your cars, uh, if you're autonomous vehicles, if you have your auto cycles, everything is going to go through a multimodal system. And if you think about it, think about Terminal C. The bright line is going to be going in over there. We're going to be connecting South Florida to Central Florida at speeds of 120 to 170 miles an hour once this thing gets up and running. We're going to be able to move around a lot quicker. Then we're going to add the componentry of the electric VTOL, which is the uh, electric vertical takeoff and landing vertiport here with Lilium. So we're going to be able to regionalize our air mobility through a airtropolis, so to speak. So we'll be able to reduce congestion on the roads by going over the roads. And we have multi-layer differentiations up in the air that we can do that with. So our multimodal system is going to be key. We're going to be able to simulate that through multi uh, mobility insight out of um, Israel. And we're going to be able to run human behavioral studies in with that as well, taking into consideration the human factor. Because we as human beings can screw anything up. Okay. So if we can build that into how the human behaviors are of how do we move around our cities? What are the, the reasons why we have congestion at certain times of the day? We'll be able to study that with that specific platform. We're going to do that through the Intelligent Mobility Center right here in Lake Nona. The who, what, why, and when are basically going to be worked on between Tavistock, the University of Central Florida, Mobility Insight, and Aero University out of Hoffa in Tel Aviv in the uh, Israel area. Mobility Insight, and we'll give that a click is going to be the, um, the platform that we're going to utilize. And this is how we're going to do it through the framework of Tavistock. And we'll build it in Lake Nona. As you can see here, we're going to be doing it mainly with uh, the University of Central Florida, Dr. Hassan, Dr. Adi, and their team to be able to bring the multimodal systems of BEEP, Lilium, DNATA, Arcimoto, Brightline, uh, Sunrail, IOMO, Lynx. We're going to blend all of that together. And be able to make a functional roadway and mobility system throughout Central Florida. And once we create it here, then those people fly into Terminal C, they come experience it in Lake Nona as they go to their theme parks, as they go to their conferences, and then kind of like Ephesus in the earlier days of the Christianity movement, people would come into the port and they leave out of the port. And wherever they go home to, they talk about the experience of the living lab. And our living lab is Tavistock, Lake Nona, and so soon to be Sunbridge of the future. And if you're interested in learning more, hit the QR code. There's a little bit of data that you can put in there and we will follow up with you. My name is Glenn Cook. Thank you so much. Um, <clears throat> so let's just move right, right into questions. Go ahead, Rick.
several situations where you know you're on a long trip, you come to a collection of chargers, and none of them are working. All right, and and so the the integrity of the ability to be able to see ahead of time accurately, not falsely, of the chargers that are available and, and even the number that are occupied at any point in time. Uh, I suggest you might want to take a look at that on a spectrum and see where you rate. I know that's quite a it's not very high, all right? Uh, but, uh, but nevertheless, you know, what are you doing to make that part of the charging experience uh, to avoid that kind of situation where people show up and there's no charging? Well, th that is a great question, and I'm glad you asked. Uh, well, um, you know, Court mentioned uh, in his presentation that uh, establishing a good sense of uh, ownership and pr propriety of uh, this uh, charging station is essential. It's a key factor to ensure that these charging stations will be well maintained and operated over the course uh, of the years. So sometimes we have seen, uh, uh, you know, some e even some cities are, are, are guilty uh, of that, uh, you know, kind of early experience where they deploy charging stations, they purchase, they deploy them out, and they offer free charging. And uh, in the, with the original intention to attract drivers, and actually that didn't work for many reasons. Uh, one of them is like nobody was responsible for the maintenance and the operation of these free chargers. And the second uh, uh, um, uh, reason why is because once it is free, people were abusing them. People were parking and plugging in and never leaving. So actually the, the purpose of offering charging to as many people as possible was killed at that time. So um, we uh, actually, the, the problem of uh, charging uh, stations that are not functioning and not being reported and actually out of service and, and frustrated people who get to that particular location with a strong need to charge and finding that the, the, the charging is not working or operating is actually that's a big problem that is being addressed by a couple of uh, uh, systems. Well, first of all, you need, an, an, as, as we pointed out during the presentation, a smart charging a station that is cloud connected and is delivering to the entire driving community the uh, whether this station is in good uh, you know operating conditions and whether it is available or being used by someone and if that is that charging is uh, working properly you should be able to reserve your spot so once you are working with the app and make a reservation that spot is reserved for you if you're planning to get there within let's say 15 20 minutes so nobody can cut you off the second is uh, you know, working with uh, a companies that actually depend on the utilization is another key factor. Uh, our, uh, uh, you know, uh, uptime is over 98% because basically we, the only source of revenue that we have is actually people connecting, plugging in and using these chargers. So if one of these uh, charging stations is down, then uh, we lose money and actually uh, it is a big problem and actually it creates, a, a, you know, kind of people start complaining online. So it is air, it is visible, it is transparent. So actually that, that damage our reputation. So we are as a company and other companies that are in the same field, they, each one of them is responsible for maintaining their own charging network. And uh, also uh, I would say the third part of that is uh, being smart and, and choosing the, the right uh, most durable charging hardware. We test every charger and every brand that is out there, but we don't work with all of them. We work with a selected group of charging stations that, are, that have proven to be durable, that we stand the elements. Uh, I mean, some of them have been through hurricanes, and actually they we turn them off like the night before the, the arrival of the, the storm to ensure that you know all the electronics won't uh, you know blow up or, or burn uh, with uh, you know powered uh, uh, you know heights. Uh, but um, and we turn them uh, back on. Uh, the, the moment we have electricity after the storm. But they, they they are there in good shape. I mean, we were lucky, a couple of them, they fell, three fell like, pretty close to the station, but nothing happened. And actually, they, they continue being in good or pretty conditions. There are many other that brands that uh, I will not mention that we never use because of exactly those same problems that you're mentioning, that they damage, they get off service, they, they lose connectivity. Actually, they are supposed to be smart, but they get off connection like so many times with so high frequency that actually happens the, the problem that you are describing. So there is a lot of uh, uh, learning in the process of expanding the network in terms of uh, brand and selection of equipment and the companies that are actually are seriously involved in maintaining and, and operating these uh, charging assets. Do we, any other, go ahead. I stole it. Uh, so I'm, when, the earlier question when you ask who isn't an EV 
participant yet. I'm one of those folks, and there's a number of reasons. Mainly, my wife and I have two cars that are paid for, very low mileage. I don't really want to hop into you know spending a hundred grand on a Tesla right now. But my question kind of centers around you know I always see the fuel cost versus you know power consumption versus like the graph that was up there. What's the total cost of ownership though when you look at a vehicle? And I maintain and keep my vehicles for a long time, right? So. I'm going to have to replace a battery. I'm going to, you know, how does that factor in? And then the other part is emergent services, right? I drove over from Tampa this morning, an hour and a half trip, took me almost two hours and 45 minutes uh, to get here. So what if I get in a situation where I've misjudged or made a mistake? What options are available out there? All right, so I'll, I'll provide a little uh, experience as, as a Tesla owner. It's, you know, one model, there's many out there, and I'm sure Glenn will have some other observations. Uh, in terms of maintenance costs, it's it's zero. There's no oil to change. There's really no parts to fix. The, the biggest problem I have is we had a busted windshield and we've had to replace tires at least four times because every roof in my neighborhood is getting uh, rebuilt. So I keep hitting nails. The tires are really expensive. That's the biggest problem. Still use those rubber tires. Um, in terms of charging costs, when I charge at home, I think it's uh, our, our rate is like 11 cents per kilowatt hour, so it's like five dollars to charge overnight. Uh, if I do a, a supercharger stop, it's going to be between 10 to 20 dollars, I'd say, maybe average around 15 dollars, and then it'll take me a couple hundred extra miles. So the other than the cost of tires, which I'm still really uh, upset about. You don't have to go and get your oil change, any kind of maintenance like that. I know, Glenn, if you want to share some experience. Glenn has a lot of cars, by the way. So, uh, Back in the day, we actually owned a uh, black car fleet with the National Limousine Association, and we were transitioning a lot of the operators out there uh, from away from fossil fuel vehicles, the Escalades and that type of stuff, over to Tesla's brand at the time. And so we did an actual case study. And we found that we were burning about $600 per vehicle per month in fossil fuels. Well, when we switched over to the Model S, Model X at the time, because there was, there was no Model 3 yet. Uh, by the way, the Model 3 cost is down under $40,000. Um, we did have a lot of expense with the tires. I will tell you that straight up front because the torque of the electric motors, you do burn more tires. We're in Florida. Roads are hotter. It happens. But when you extrapolate those costs over a five-year time period, because in the black car industry, you have to migrate out of that vehicle required by Uber, by Lyft, um, by uh, Black Lane. There's, there's other providers out there that we can actually pump the data in from the geofence of the airport to execute those drives and collect the data. But when you extrapolate it over five years, we actually reduced our maintenance and cost of fuel by two-thirds. Because we're running these vehicles on one, two, and three shifts. And then on top of that, we didn't have the downtime associated with bringing that vehicle out of the rotation and putting it into the maintenance shop. In the busing industry, which I was a motor coach uh, operator, hundreds of vehicles, um, I was a director, board director for the motor coach and the limousine association for many years while I was doing lobbying in DC. We found when you're not also paying for the diesel fuel surcharge or the DEF systems on top of that, these are add-on type of things. And while you might be a resident, you charge at home majority of the time. And if you're on a long trip, yeah, you stop out of a DC3 charger and you're, and you're paying 40 cents per kilowatt. But for the most part, you're paying 11 cents from home to charge on a level two while you're sleeping anyway. Yeah. You know, I'm really curious about the battery aspect of it. So at five years, you may or may not have had to replace the battery in those cars, right? Uh, my personal experience, the, ba the batteries have always been under warranty. Never had to replace one ever. And I have over 200,000 miles on a Model S Tesla right now. I'll just add, there, there are a lot of questions about battery use, uh, recycling. I did see a uh, story yesterday that uh, car batteries are being repurposed for uh, solar microgrids in California uh, because they don't need that kind of load. So I, I think it's a great example of how we can kind of reuse this and provide better resilience for, you know, when we have power outages. All right, we got another question back here. Yeah, I was here about uh, two or three years ago and there was a presentation on, uh, I don't know if it was the uh, city of Orlando or the county wide, but 6,000 school buses being converted to electric buses and uh, uh, I don't you probably remember that I'd like to know the what happened because I heard that infrastructure was 
it was big big problem with the transformers and everything in the space that because all the buses needed to be charged at the same time pretty much I, I'm actually not familiar with that, <clears throat> that project I do know that there is quite a bit of uh, federal money for fleet transition um, so I, I, I don't know if anybody knows I, about, I mean, I'll, Kurt, I'll, yeah. I'll, I'll jump in I know um, I don't know about that particular example but in Montgomery County Montgomery County Maryland just successfully completed a uh, a photovoltaic powered microgrid to power their buses and it's an equivalent number of buses um, and they did that because financially it, it was a stronger business case and it didn't have the lead time of permitting and working with the utilities so it's pretty much a standalone microgrid island did that can connect to the utility as needed so I think that probably that was early a few years ago but now we're really starting to see that and school buses, garbage trucks, uh, perfect use case for EVs. If I may add to that, uh, in addition to the microgrids, uh, battery storage, the same way battery storage has proven to be a great addition to solar farms because uh, now they can sell or resell the electricity when the, when the consumption is high and the, the cost of a kilowatt hour is higher. Uh, battery storage has also been a great solution to, to lower uh, the uh, the uh, stress on the electric grid when we are adding several DC fast chargers mm -hmm. for public transportation because you don't need to draw that much power at any given time. Actually, you, you charge directly from a battery that is stationary battery that is uh, slowly being charged while it's not being in use. So actually, that's how you, you, you manage that at the same time. There are, there are really fascinating developments happening in that area, not only battery storage, but uh, Florida Power and Light, in fact, has, has their uh, lab where, for example, they, they are piloting some flywheel charging so that for a fast charger, you don't need the permitting and all the infrastructure to bring that 480 volt line to that DC fast charger. It will be just a, perhaps a 110 or a 220 line to the flywheel, and the flywheel charges up and then the start discharges its energy only when you need to actually do your charging. Uh, one more thing I do want to add to that is that we are also currently working on a new policy for it's called V to G, which is vehicle to grid. Um, a lot of your vehicles, especially your larger vehicles like your school buses, like Jim was talking about, uh, can actually be a storage component for microgrid. So in the event we have an event like a hurricane and we have to utilize our schools for a uh, security safety site for people to, to go into, you can actually power that school off of the bus. So at, and if you're, you're powering it off solar and you're, you're powering it throughout the day when the sun is out or the wind is blowing or whatever, you can store it in the bus or store it in the microgrid or a virtual power plant, so to speak, and then actually be able to go back into your business, your school, your home through the virtual power plant and our v, v to G. And there is a software out there that actually is called AutoBidder that actually tempers when you turn it on and when you turn it off so you're not draining your vehicle at a given time when you need it the most but you only give to the grid when there's peak power needs. We're, we're just about out of time. So I would just, I'd like to ask our panelists, uh, are there any points we've, uh, you'd like to touch on that we've forgotten? Go ahead. Well, no, actually V2G, I was just about to, to mention that. So thanks uh, for adding that. Uh, I mean, that's uh, where the future is uh, going in, in this uh, business, in this technology, is the uh, possibility to install bi-directional chargers and, and offer uh, those drivers the possibility also to resell a portion of the excess storage uh, or power stored in the batteries back to the grid at a profit. So let's say that you can charge at, at, at 20 cents per kilowatt in the morning and then you resell a portion of that uh, power stored in your battery back to the grid during the times of uh, peak energy consumption. So that actually allows uh, uh, drivers to offset a portion of their uh, fueling cost providing an additional incentive for people to drive electric. Mm -hmm. And I will add also that um, electric vehicles and autonomous vehicles now have added the componentry of being kind of like a mobile iPhone. So they're really data collectors. And as you might have heard now, data is the new oil. And because we live here in Central Florida, we have a lot of data collectors around here. And as we get this urban economy kicked off, like Kurt was saying, we get these 60 million people a year coming through our airports, coming to our conferences, coming to our theme parks. We are collecting all that data through this, through Verizon, through T-Mobile, through AT&T. We collect all that data of how people move throughout our city. 
And we can sell that data because we have an onslaught of 60 million people a year to external companies, to external municipalities. And that's an additional revenue stream for our airport, for our rental car association. Hertz just bought a bunch of Teslas. So data, new oil. All right, Glenn, I've got one last question. Dick, one, one this quick is it. question, and maybe this is directed to Kurt. Uh, you put up some numbers there that uh, uh, I think it was 7.5 billion that's going to be allocated to uh, federal federal money coming for uh, infrastructure for charging infrastructure, and then you had a couple other. Give us a little more details on how that's going to be allocated. I'm presuming this is coming out of the overall major infrastructure bill. Correct. But um, and you mentioned that some of this is going to go to to some some private companies and so forth. Uh, wouldn't any of the, wouldn't the government contract with whoever is yeah, going so to be building the, this infrastructure and so forth? It kind of explain that a little better. Okay, uh, I'll try to break it down. So, in out of the seven and a half billion, Florida will get almost two hundred billion over the next five years, uh, and that can cover what are called eligible costs. Working with private industry is considered an eligible cost, so they can work through government in order to access that. So it's kind of the um, the difference, I would say, between DOT building a bridge or hiring a contractor to build the bridge. Um, so that's how it, there's a little bit of flexibility. Uh, Alejandro said, you know, he's got an incentive to keep this up and running uh, because he makes money through it. So it's, um, whereas a state agency with no experience doing this could have a tougher time with the user experience. So I think that's where it's great that it provides a lot of flexibility. This is still evolving. You know, they haven't actually let the bids yet. So you just have to keep an eye on it, but uh, it's good to know that there is uh, significant funding out there for this opportunity. I certainly learned an awful lot from each and every one of our speakers today. So please join me in just, in just thanking them for, for being here today.